we arrive in the Jaria coal fields in India's eastern state of Jharkhand. I can see a hillside that seems to be half on fire. In this open cast mine, seams of pure coal have ignited. But you can see that there are flames all around us. The fires spread deep underground. What the mining company is trying to do is put out a fire that has ignited the entire hillside here. What causes this coal to catch fire? The cause is the only the only uh, cause is the oxidation. Shiv Shringi, an engineer with the state company BCCL, explains how the chemical properties of the coal in this part of India cause it to heat up on contact with open air and then catch fire. In areas where there are old coal mine shafts, it oxidizes on contact with the air. Eventually, it reaches a critical temperature and then spontaneously combusts. And how many fires have you got in your coal mines? In the whole of the BCCL is under fire, particularly in Jharia 67 fires have been identified. 67 fires. 67 right. fires. So that's an area of hundreds of square kilometers. 360. Uh, 360. 360 square kilometers yeah. affected by fire. Incredibly, the fires have raged for nearly a hundred years, soon after the first coal mines were opened here. India extracts 400 million tons of coal a year. Jaria's mines are part of this massive industry that fuels India's powerhouse economy. BCCL, the state-owned Bharat Coking Coal Limited, allowed us to go down one of its underground mines. Moving on down into the darkness towards the coal face. These guys are wrestling with this machine. It's hot, it's humid, and it's dangerous. And this is part of India's massive coal industry, feeding electricity and steel industries for the economy. BCCL is Jaria's main employer, with more than 75,000 workers in its mines. At the coal face, I meet one of the foremen, Sanjay. Against the nature. Sanjay says that it's very challenging, they're working against nature, but he really enjoys it. We trek through a maze of underground tunnels that extends for miles before we reach the surface. What we realize back on the surface is that all of this is happening under a town, and it's the tunnels that are the cause of the subterranean fires. Mining provides a livelihood for Jaria, but the underground inferno also threatens the health and homes of millions. This is Bokapadi village, where hundreds of families live above the fires. You can see the, the intense heat coming up from the earth here. It's so hot that, that a piece of paper... Look at that. There you go. That is how hot the ground beneath our feet is. And everywhere there are these little fissures and cracks with smoke bubbling up and sulfurous gases. It's quite amazing, the stench, and people are living right here all around us. Walking through the village, we find one family cooking a meager breakfast yards away from cracks belching heat and poisonous fumes. The mother, Gaytree, shows us her family home, where eight people live in a tiny hut that is collapsing around them. This is as a result of subsidence. You can see these huge cracks in the wall. Gaytree, why don't you take your family to live in a slightly safer place? Isn't there somewhere that's, that's better for you to live? Uh, Gaytree tells me they're so poor they have no choice but to stay in the village because it's near the coal that gives them an income. 
She says that if they lived anywhere else, they wouldn't be able to make a living out of the mine as they do. And it's as a result of, of living here that they're able to eat. <coughs> And this is their livelihood, coal scavenging. In this vast open BCCL mine next to Bokapadi, we find hundreds of villagers stealing coal. People are rushing in before the slag has even been deposited to try to find the best bits of coal. It's an incredibly dangerous job. It's hot, people are breathing poisonous fumes, and the walls of this colliery are on fire. It feels as if we're in the middle of an oven. These are the conditions that people have to work in here. It's a vision of hell, and many of those toiling in the mine are just children. We find Gaytree's daughter, Dolly, working amongst the rubble. Do you ever take days off or do you work every day? Dolly says they work here every day, all year round, without a break. None of the people in her family have attended school. This is the only life that they can make. Dolly says she knows it's dangerous for her and her family to live here, but they have no alternative except to stay working in the mines. This is really back-breaking work. Dolly doesn't have any shoes. She's walking across sharp stones and boiling hot coals. Now she's got this steep hill, and this is what she does all day, every day. Once Dolly has collected her coal, she prepares it for sale. This involves partially burning it, a process known as coking, so that it does not smoke. It's just after dawn in Bukapadi, and the sunrise is obscured by all of the smoke in the air. And all around us, you can see plumes of smoke rising from the mines where the coal has been burning. When Dolly's coal is ready, she bags it up and then starts the journey into town. <laughs> Every morning, Dolly and her friends go house to house trying to sell their coal. Most people in Jaria still use coal for cooking, and that's another reason why the atmosphere is so polluted here. Dolly has made less than a pound, the fruit of a day's labor. That is enough to eat once for the family in one day. She says that she doesn't know what they'll do this evening. This is the only thing that keeps Dolly and her family from starvation. Until a few years ago, this wasteland was a place of forests and farms. But as mining destroys the environment, farmers are forced to become artisan coal miners. We've just arrived in this artisanal mining area and the activity is illegal. And as soon as we arrived, we saw lots of people running, men, women, and also children. We meet Devanand, who works in a nearby mine with his father. Where's he taking the coal? My home. This kid, Devanand, is rolling two lumps of coal down the hill. He says that he's taking it home. And there aren't any houses here for a long distance. Devanand is only eight years old. It's going to take him all day at this rate and uh, he moves ahead about five feet and then he goes back to collect uh, his tiffin can and then comes back to roll the coal again. It really is very difficult to watch this. In this mine west of 
Jaria, hundreds of people are not just scavenging for coal. They're digging their own shafts into the rock. Once extracted, the coal is loaded onto bikes and then transported to market. This bike alone is carrying 100, 120 kilos of coal, and they've got a journey that will take them a couple of miles to town. Entire families work together in these mines. They all used to be farmers, and this was their land. Then it was destroyed by large-scale mining, and so they were forced to follow suit and extract coal themselves. We squeeze down a narrow underground shaft where miners are hacking away with picks and shovels. There's particles of coal flying everywhere, and I can see there are no safety measures being taken at all. This is the little boy Devanan's father, Sanjay. He says that they don't have light, they don't have proper shoes, and they don't have helmets, and that makes them vulnerable to collapses in the mines. Why don't you get a job in the official mines? Isn't this a very dangerous way to make a living? He says there aren't enough jobs in the official mines, so he has no choice. Making around a pound a day, coal is a means of survival. But people are still imprisoned in a cycle of poverty. Beneath their feet is immense wealth, but above ground, people are crowding into slums. We visit Bastakola village with Dr. Manoy Singh, who helps the poor. Here we learn how pollution from the mines causes widespread health problems. As we arrive, residents crowd around the doctor. The villagers are coming to the doctor with all of their health problems. And they're not just respiratory illnesses to do with pollution. They're all of the ailments related to poverty. Dr. Singh lists a battery of lung diseases caused by air pollution, from bronchitis to asthma. He says that respiratory illness in this part of India is twice the rate that it is elsewhere in the country. Dr. Singh takes us to meet one of his regular patients. Parvati Devi says her family spent their lives working in the coal fields. Her husband and a daughter were killed by respiratory illnesses. Now she is sick, and her surviving daughter is getting nosebleeds. The state company BCCL provides free health care for its employees and their families, but the rest of the population must fend for themselves. The doctor thinks that BCCL and the coal companies should do more to alleviate the pollution and environmental damage here, which is the cause of people's health problems. BCCL says it is concerned about people's health and safety but that the best thing for them is to move out of the danger zone. We had seen BCCL trying to extinguish coal fires, but some mining experts claim that BCCL has let the fires spread to populated areas, and so made things even worse. We visit the village of Dr. Barun Mitra. Just two years ago, yeah. everything was green. That place there you see, it's completely black today. Yeah. It was completely green. It's an idyllic Indian village, but cracks are opening in homes and the fires are advancing beneath. It's like an oven down here. I've got my hand just under this bench made out of mud and it is really hot. It's, hot. it's extraordinary. It's too hot to keep your hand. Villager Bablu Roy tells me BCCL recently came and told them to leave. 
and by way of compensation they've been offered 2,000 rupees. That's about 25 pounds per household. Babu Roy explains that it's not enough for his family to find a new home. Babu Roy says that he has no alternative but to stay here if the coal company can't offer them alternative land. Dr. Mitra's family has pleaded with BCCL and its chief managing director to tackle the advancing fires. They claim the company's only response has been to warn them to evacuate. Now here, here are some of the letters that we have given to the BCCL authority, including the CMD. And how long do these letters go back? How many years? This letter is given uh, in the year 1979 to the general manager BCCL, area number six. I've got a sheaf of letters that go back nearly 30 years, attempting to alert the authorities of the problem of a subterranean coal fire. None of these letters to BCCL, the government coal company, have ever been answered. BCCL's master plan is to move 500,000 people out of the fire-affected areas. It claims to offer not just money to these people, but is also constructing new homes. We're driving to a place called Belgaria. This is a housing scheme funded by BCCL to accommodate people it wants to move out of Jaria. It's about 10 kilometers out of town. This is the housing some people will get by way of compensation for losing their homes in the fire-affected mining zones. At the estate, we find no work going on and nobody from BCCL. A Jaria resident, Ashok Agawal, shows us around. So, what are we looking at here, Ashok? You're looking at the houses that are the, are the quarters that are being provided to the people who will be relocated here. This will be the kitchen, uh -huh. and this will be the master bedroom. The only one room that they're going to get right. is around 11 feet by 9 feet. How many people are supposed to be accommodated here? There are families having members of around 10, 7, 6, that is the type of uh, membership that a family has. So very overcrowded if Naturally, yeah. they, they've got uh, daughters, sons, daughter-in-laws, so all of them will have to be accommodated in this one room. Residents like Ashok say BCCL is increasing the pressure for people to move out of the fire-prone areas now. There's 3,000 flats. That doesn't even begin to accommodate the 500,000 people who need to be moved. In any way, they're not finished, and people have so far refused to come here. We visit BCCL's headquarters to meet the chief executive, Tapas Lahiri. I want to ask him about residents' concerns, including those of the Mitra family. Are you controlling the fires? Wherever possible, we are controlling, but wherever it is not possible, there is no approach, where is, there is no means, then we are not. But we, we had an intention and we tried our best and put our all effort to control. And that's why it is still uh, oxidation rate has been controlled. What we've discovered is that the residents are very willing to move, but they fear that if they move, that accommodation will be inadequate because the rooms at Belgaria are 9 feet by 11 feet. This is a part of master plan. We cannot, uh, we cannot make any comments on it. Whatever the size, the size has been, of the house. Whatever the right. size, 27 square meter, right. it is the provision of master plan and the uh, houses have been made as per the design of master plan. Me the letters, so it's not we based bring up on the issue of financial compensation on, which I mean, the Mitra family got had raised. Now I understand that you've offered them 2,000 rupees each household. Does that make sense to you? And if whatever being a public sector we do, we do only as per our policies, as per our decision, as per our guideline. The stray cases or the complaint which may not have genuinity, this only all can be said only after examination. If there is, there is genuinity, Justice will definitely be done to him. Because we are doing, as I said, we are doing this thing for thousands and thousands of people every year. So, and we being the public sector, we cannot do anything beyond the law. 
While BCCL and the residents bicker over compensation, the relentless advance of the fires will burn people out of their homes anyway. We've arrived on the edge of a massive open cast coal mine, and up here on top of the slopes are the remains of what was once a village. This settlement has been turned into a ghost town. I've just met Mohammed in the village of Kusunda, or what's left of it. Everything is coated in coal dust. It's a dying landscape. It's completely dried out, uninhabited now. And you can see what looks to be the remains of houses here. So what happened here? Muhammad says two years ago, at about 2.30 in the morning, the ground beneath their homes just collapsed and several houses were engulfed. He and his family survived, but his brother and six others of his family were all killed in the accident. Muhammad explains how the accident occurred. He says BCCL had warned residents here to move. They were so poor they were compelled to stay living on top of the fires until the accident The grass is all burned. It's been turned to a dusty, dead black. You can smell fumes of burning gases. It's a really eerie, scary environment. As we walk across ground that might collapse at any second, Muhammad tells me this was once a thriving place with 500 houses, a school, and a temple. Within two weeks of the accident, it was abandoned. Muhammad says that it was hard luck that they were born here in Kasunda, and ever since the accident that killed his brother's family, he says life has been incredibly hard. And meanwhile, this place is just burning and subsiding into the earth. Everywhere we go in Jaria, the fires are burning. This entire seam is burning all the way around the open cast mine. Millions of tons of coal ignited. These are fires that are completely out of control over a huge area. India is expanding its massive coal industry to fuel economic growth, but it is doing this at enormous cost to its own people and the environment. Thanks for watching this classic Unreported World episode. Click the logo to subscribe for more award-winning documentaries from the Unreported World team. We upload videos every Wednesday and Sunday, keeping you up to date with content from all over the world.